Today we're going to be talking about viscoelastic materials, where the stress can change with time. And we're going to talk about two different types of models that are used to start off looking at viscoelastic materials. So we're going to do the Maxwell model and the standard linear model. Those are the two types of models we're going to use, where you have viscous stress and strain, which is like a, a fluid kind of stress and strain. But then we also have a more advanced model, the SLS, the standard linear model that includes both viscous forces and elastic kinds of forces. So, time-dependent mechanical response means that these viscoelastic materials are both viscous and elastic behavior. And we've talked about elastic materials where the stress is proportional to the strain. It's basically like a spring. You put some stress on it and it deforms a little bit proportionally to the Young's modulus, the stiffness of the material. And that's basically an instantaneous relationship. You stress it and it deforms, or you deform it and you get a stress. Now, the strain rate, if we put in viscous, a viscous equation, stress is proportional to the strain rate. And this proportionality constant for this relationship is called the viscosity. And now it's a time-dependent relationship between the stress and the strain rate. So now we have a, a more complicated system. The original model for elastic materials is very simple. It's just an instantaneous equilibrium kind of model. But now we have a time-dependent relationship to consider. And this happens a lot in biomedical systems. Uh, you have soft tissues that have large molecules, basically like polymers. Hydrogels are types of things that are used in, in biomedical systems. It's not an atomic lattice like you might find in, in metal or ceramic. It's more of a polymetric network that um, can basically have a, a lot more interesting molecular interactions. So why do we have to do this? Well, we often have a viscous component in mechanical response. So we, we have a load that is periodic or cyclical or a long period of time, say uh, something that goes into a joint. You're going to put stress on it repeatedly over and over and over in time. So you have in the spine, you have forces applied there for longer, longer times, over and over a longer period of time than just a simple instantaneous stress-strain relationship. So we want these materials to resist failure. So this viscous dissipation helps let some of that energy that's going into molecular bonds basically be dissipated over time. So people can look at uh, tissue material adhesives for looking at sealing surgical wounds. There's different approaches for this, but basically there, it's a more complicated model for more complicated materials. Now, this also will eventually relate to thermodynamics, where you have the increasing internal energy, and you'll talk about entropy. This is a, a lot of students will take a class on biomedical thermodynamics in their sophomore or junior year. So we're talking about stretching bonds and then changing of order, which is entropy, and how you model that relating stress and strain. Now, for the model, if we hold, simplify things, we will have a constant strain maintained over time. So basically, you take a material and you stretch it, pull it apart, and then measure the stress as a function of time. So you know the strain is going to be a constant. It's going to go from zero to some value, constant strain, can be held at that constant strain value. Then you measure the stress as it has an initial maximum stress. And then as the bonds rearrange, you get to an equilibrium stress. So that's the kind of model we're going to be looking at. And it's time dependent. Something happens at T0, you start the test, you stretch the material, and then you look at the force that it applies. So stress relaxation has this instantaneous response. A time course exponential decrease, typically, we're going to model it with an exponential, and this equilibrium value when the stress is no longer changing. So there's not a time dependent, this is the equilibrium value when everything's settled out, it's no longer a time dependent phenomenon. So we have this for the same strain change where its strain is held constant, we look at this kind of curve that has this, these typical shapes. The first model is starting with a spring with a stiffness k. We have a, we're going to approximate that as a string. And instead of a Young's modulus, we're going to use k here to relate stress and strength. 
There's also a mechanical device called a dash pot, basically a piston with a fluid in there, and it's sort of like a shock absorber. And this is a mechanical representation of this differential equation, where we have stress being related to the strain rate, the rate of change of strain with this, this costy it's a aid. So visco, uh, visco elastic solid models use these two equations. And we can model the stress relax relaxation for sustained or constant strain. So we have the spring for the mechanical response and the dash pot as well. So you put these two together and we get a, a sometimes we get a very good model even with a fairly simple two equation, three equation model. The Maxwell model is the first simple model where you have a spring in series with a dash pot. So the total stress, if you pull on this from here and here, the total stress is the stress on the spring and the stress on the dash pot. And they should be the same because if you're pulling overall, the overall system, the two components are going to see the same amount of stress. The strain, the total strain, is going to be the sum of the spring and the dash pot. So that's from the physical model that we're using, even though we're basically a, a look at considering this at the molecular level, these are the equations we are using. So what are we going to do with that? Well, we have these these assumptions here. We have this model for the spring, this model for the dash pot. We have stress and strain for the spring and dash pot. So if we take the time derivative of this equation, we end up with DDT of strain, which is this plus this. So we have time derivatives there because we're trying to get work in this equation. So this E dot D is already known. If we take the time derivative of this equation, sigma dot equals k, uh, stress, the rate of change of stress is equal to the rate of k times the rate of strain, ch change of strain for the spring. So we have um, epsilon s dot and epsilon d dot. So we have values for these two. So we can put these values in, solve for epsilon s dot, and we know epsilon d dot. So we have these two values now. If we have this value on the right-hand side and this value on the left-hand side, we can solve this equation and get it in this form. Now, we're going to define, basically, tau is eta over k. So we've gotten rid of eta and k. Put basically, we have k on the left-hand side, and we have 1 over tau over here. Now, this is a more complex model than we had before. because We used two different models but we've been able to reconcile them because of the assumptions we made here into a single model for this Maxwell system relating stress and strain. Stress and stress rate to strain rate. So, if we have that assumption, going back, this is the relationship. If we make the assumption that we put a strain on there and hold it constant, when we do that, the strain rate only changes once. So basically, epsilon dot goes to zero. So we get this relationship. Well, that's a fairly simple relationship. Uh, it just means that the rate of change of sigma is proportional to this value on the right hand side. So we can actually solve this one, even with calc 1, calc 2 ability, because I separate and integrate. It's a very simple differential equation. You rearrange derivatives on either side, get the sigmas on one side and the um, t on the other side, integrate everything from the initial value for sigma to the final value, zero to t, solve those two equations, and then rearrange again, and you get an expression that gives you uh, the stress rate. Stress is a function of time. It's a simple exponential that has the initial stress value, time, and tau, which we said we defined tau earlier as a relationship between eta, the viscosity, and k, the spring constant. So at t equals zero, only the spring is deformed. So at t equals zero, e to the zero is one. So we get sigma naught. So this initial value 
is so we can find sigma naught from that. As t goes to infinity, the stress in this relationship, as t goes to infinity, e to the minus infinity goes to zero. So we expect an exponential decay. It goes to zero. It hits the maximum value at time t zero of sigma naught, maximum stress rate. But here is the important part. When t equals tau, you can plug in t equals to tau here. And we find that e to the minus 1 is 36%. So that means when stress hits 36% of its maximum value, we can figure out what tau is. That's the time value here. Um, again, this is not exactly realistic for solids, but in some cases it can be a simple model that's applied. You typically will never have a stress of zero if you have some strain on a solid. So we went on, we'll go to a more complicated model, the SLS model that has both two sides, a maximal model here. We have the maximal model in parallel with a simple spring model, an elastic model. So we have two elastic models with two spring coefficients, K1 and Ke. We have this costi of that dash pot model. So we have three simple equations that we're going to put together by making these assumptions. We can um, say that, you know, the, the total, we have two different arms put together and we're pulling and measuring at these two points. But it's a little bit hard, more difficult to, to solve. You have to get to differential equations. So the resulting equation for a constant strain solution gives us this form of the expression. Where it's, if we only had the Maxwell arm, we would go back to this simple expression for a constant strain test. But for this SLS model, we have a more complicated expression that has multiple parameters. We still have tau, which is a relationship between viscosity and eta, and we have these two spring coefficients. So the response should look like this. So given a step change in the strain, held constant in the strain, the stress is going to peak at some initial value, sigma naught, so you can determine sigma naught. And if you know sigma naught, you can kind of put plug T into here, this value is equal to, since we know sigma at time T equals zero, it's equal to when we plug in T equals zero, we get uh, the initial strain times Ke plus K1. So that gives us an equation. We know this value from a chart. At time t equals infinity, e to the infinity goes to zero, so we know that the right-hand side of this value should be a to naught times ke, and we have a value that we read off the stress plot as a function of time. Now, how do we find tau? Actually, before that, how do we find a to naught? Well, that's from the initial strain that we applied to the material. How do we find tau? We know it's 8 over k1. How do we find that? Well, again, we talk about the plugging in t equals tau. At times t equals tau, the stress has relaxed from zero relaxation to 63% of its relaxation before it gets to 100%. So basically, one has the stress reduced about two-thirds of the way down to its equilibrium value. So that point in time is t equals tau. Once you know that point in time, from this time t equals zero to time t equals tau, you know a time, you can back out these relationships. So good luck looking at stress and strain relationships using Maxwell mm -hmm. equations, Maxwell models, and simple linear models, SLS models.